So virtual reality is uh, a sensory rich simulation that is indistinguishable from your actual corporeal reality. It's a, it's a, it's a way to digitally mediate your sensory experience of the world. And this can happen in, in a couple of different ways. There's uh, virtual reality is a full sensory deprivation and replacement. So you're taking the, the sensory information that you would normally be gathering, shutting it down, and you know, going into like the equivalent of a digital float tank and then pumping new information into your sensory receptors. Uh, augmented reality, you are uh, combining, you are augmenting your sensory, uh, the sensory information that you're getting with layers of new information that are working with what's there already. So with virtual reality, you need full, you know, full shut it, shut it off and pump in something new. Augmented reality, you need to be, uh, your, your devices and everything need to be aware of everything that's in the room and then they provide layers on top of it. Um, mixed reality is you are not using any kind of device, but you are um, experiencing a reality that is both um, actually there and digitally overlaid. Um, and then, I don't know, there's all kinds of new realities being formed every day. I was recently at a conference where somebody was like, oh, you're in the reality industry. <laughs> Yes, I suppose I am. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting. I think we're going to see a lot of um, new thought patterns emerging uh, because up until now, you know, there, there are basically so scientists have been on have been researching sensory perception for years, and what they found is that sixty percent of what you perceive, you're actually inventing, and um, so so it's you're taking in. All of this information. I saw somebody just kind of sort of side with what? Um, yeah, it's you're you're taking in a lot of information and you're filtering it, and your brain is doing this really good job of, of filtering things that are happening and combining them in weird ways. So a really good example of this is the sound from my voice is traveling to your ear at something like 720 miles per hour. I'm sure some of you can know the exact number on that, but the light is traveling, you know, almost infinitely faster than that. Yet you're perceiving the sound and the light hitting, are, are happening at the same time, right? This is happening at the same time. And that's because your brain is taking, your brain is taking the sound and the light and putting a delay on the light so that it matches up with the sound. Um, so, up until, so, so up until now, and, and this sensory perception, when it gets to more complicated things, is really informed by a very deep, pantheon of, of myth that we all spend our entire lives developing. Um, if you're familiar with the work of Joseph Campbell, he writes a lot about this. And, and so what's been interesting is up until now, the, the three primary, well, always the three primary drivers of that mythic pantheon are primary sensory experience. I do something, this is what happens. I learn a lesson, right? I touch the pot, it's hot. I learn not to touch the pot because I burn myself. Secondary sensory experience, you watch something happen to somebody. Oh, I saw that man walk along a wall and he fell off and hurt himself. Therefore, I know that's what happens when you walk along a wall, right? I'm using sort of painful things. Or, or cultural indoctrination. And, and cultural indoctrination is, um, is, is basically enough other people around tell me that this is what's going to happen, so I'm going to go along with them. So we all agree that if you... You know, get drunk and get behind the wheel, you're gonna drive into something, right? And, and crash your car. So we don't do that because, you know, even even though um, uh, even though we've never done it, it's still something we believe, right? Um, so it turns out that primary sensory experience is the most credible and least available driver. Um, uh, up until now, our media experiences, our education experiences, our you know digital erotic experiences, are all driven by cultural indoctrination. Like we, the the, the way that framed media works on us is not a direct sensory experience. It's not even secondary sensory experience. It's that it's that third category. It's watching people play out a scenario according to beliefs that we all you know we all look at it and we go. Yes, that is that is correct. That becomes a piece of our popular culture. We can elevate it, and we hold that up as a, an example. So, with VR, this is the first time we've been able to create media where people go in and decide for themselves 
does this feel right? And I think that that is going to have a huge impact. Like, like putting pieces out there where you can't really control what people are saying about it. There's no sort of group, there's no sort of policing in the audience that's going on. Um, I think that this is going to cause a lot of a lot of very major, very rapid cultural shifts when this thing comes to scale. Yeah, in huge ways. I mean, it, it's in ways that we can't really we can't really comprehend right now. We, it don't make sense to us in retrospect. We'll look back and we'll go, oh yeah, well then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. The way it always does. But like right now, looking forward, like the way we relate to each other, the way we work together, um, it, it has the potential to change all these things. I think the, the question is going to be, you know, will we, where do we come to in terms of mutual agreement between the, the dominant existing culture and this, this new disruptive force that's coming into it? And, and that intersection is going to be really fertile, really fertile ground. I think the first thing in place that's going to happen is the internet. It's, it's going to be in your browser. That's, and that's when this thing really scales. Yeah, it's going to change, it's going to fundamentally change the way we, we interact with the internet first. And, and the internet is going to be a, become a, a spatial place um, that we can freely explore and move through as if they were rooms in a house. Okay. So for the, the other three of you, focusing in on the internet, I mean, in the first stage here, where are you seeing the virtual reality begin to show up? It, how, how do you each see virtual reality and augmented reality coming into the picture? Are you seeing people ask about it? Look at the, the new technology for some reason. I, I look at the, what is practical for, for delivery to the home for the user and the, the implementation of technologies. And, and virtual reality immediately goes there's an enormous amount of parts that are practical, and there's an enormous amount, but there's no parts that are not practical. It just is an issue of is this a five year timeline for this one, a 10 year timeline for that one, and every single element will be a practical at some point. Practical implementation for some may end up being a log holographic representation and presentations because of the social environment that is demanded there. So virtual reality is, is the very beginning of the virtual reality that we all see today. The, uh, the max headroom kind of world is, is really nothing more than just that you know, album cover of max headroom compared to where it will be 20 years from now. Uh, conversely, when we looked at 3D, there was production elements that could never, nobody in the production industry could really get their head around, how am I going to make this and make it in a cost-effective manner? How am I going to produce this element? How am I going to get it from this point to that point? And effectively, it died on the vine. Um, HD, there was never a question that HD was going to happen. It was just an issue how quickly the chips can get there. So now, what we've got is with virtual reality, though it's been, the concept has been out there for many, many, many years, what we the marketplace has allowed itself to evolve with, now your tool is in your hand with every mobile device we have. I don't know, what, what is my associates here that run so much of the internet probably know how much exactly to the present of what Consumption is on the mobile device versus your browser. It's almost like you know a, a step backwards when I have to get my browser on my PC compared to getting it on my iPad or my iPhone or whatever other Android device. But you've got a device that gives you the real virtual reality environment, and you now have um, you know, everybody is writing apps to those devices, and so all of that stuff is sitting out there. Uh, now, it, uh, you know, so the, the transport mechanism is not the, for me, in our business, transport mechanism for video in real life was the real issue before. Now it's like, who cares about transport? It'll be up there. You know, it's now all the applications and the applications that go on the devices which make virtual reality yeah, real in every aspect. Uh, as a, and it's just like, which ones do you put the effort into? First, is it gaming? Is it uh, remote uh, operation 
views when you know doing uh, you know, the latency is a bit of an issue when you're trying to move a scalpel around. Um, <laughs> you know, but is it gaming? We're looking at all sorts of different things like horse racing, virtual reality and horse racing. That you have a global virtual reality horse racing. So I I right now do not see anything preventing virtual reality from being an enormous amount of success. Uh, <coughs> there is just making sure that whoever hits the building blocks right, whether it be my associate up here, or whoever hits that right is gonna be the real, you know, real super winner. said that goes around latency. You know, I was in the data center business and what we're seeing our customers ask for is not a replacement for the large scale data centers, you know, the mega complex, et cetera. What I think the data centers are going to evolve to is edge computing, where the tolerancy for latency that you can withstand today, things like virtual reality, you're not, they're not going to be able to withstand those latencies. So, We'll be extending the data centers and the networks out to the edge, not just in primary markets, but secondary markets. And then within that data center, we see that there's an opportunity for traditional co-location space for people that want to bring their own kit. Also believe there's an opportunity there for cloud or infrastructure providers for the smaller companies that don't have the scale, that need the benefit and can't handle the logistics. And then I also see the same thing that you see in a traditional data center for meat users. Where all of your local providers, Celex, wireless, can all peer locally so that the traffic really never leaves that local market. So the trick, I think, in the data center world is to be able to extend them to the edge and to the best degree possible get the same level of resiliency in the data center. And I think that, but that, you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to build these big $100 million facilities at those edges. So I think it's also going to drive a lot more resiliency in the applications that support the willingness for a data center to go down, for it to be able to move, and that will drive certain tech network technologies like software defined networking as well. Yeah, so uh, I think we're, we're looking at it from a few different angles. Um, Entity as a company is uh, both an enterprise business and uh, in Japan we're a, a consumer driven business in terms of where we supply this. So we've got, depending on where we are in the world, we're looking at uh, VR and AR from a kind of different lens. Um, and also we look at kind of the different layers of the business. You've got the, uh, the development side of the business, people are developing the, the content. Um, we've already got customers around the world who, who have very intensive software development uh, operations and typically they're developing uh, in, in three different continents, 24 by 7, moving large files around. You know, the difference with VR and AR is you know, their files are if you compare it to software development for, for, uh, for chips and, and uh, uh, other content, um, you know, their files Look like they're about five or six times bigger. So this is just you know, larger files being developed, probably in a similar uh, kind of 24 by 7, um, you know, multi-continent basis. Um, so that's of interest to us. That generates traffic. Uh, it generates the collaboration, um, and uh, you know, and, and the ability to move large amounts of data efficiently uh, in a short amount of time. Um, then when you look at, um, uh, you know, at the consumer layer, um, you know, we've already seen with, with, with Pokemon that, that you know, the mobile device is going to be a, a, a big uh, kind of element of, of uh, augmented reality. And uh, it seems to be working just fine with the infrastructure, the infrastructure that's in place today. But, you know, the, these things are just going to get more sophisticated, more complex demands on, on the network so you know um, fifth generation uh, mobile data is, is probably going to come into play um, as the uh, IAR evolves um, that's uh, something that we're, we're interested in um, but also you know you, the, the gamers are the early adopters so you know, who's going to benefit from that uh, might be the, the last mile providers who are going to have demand for you know, much higher capacity connections to, to be 
same as these. Um, and then finally, you know, we, we kind of look at, well, let's look at what, what's happened before. Um, what's a similar kind of um, technology that, that evolved? And if you look at uh, the, the uh, streaming music business, right, they, they, had, they had similar challenges. How do you move large files around in, a, in an infrastructure that's really not built for this? And you know, no surprise that the peer to peer came along as an innovation to kind of overcome that. So we can expect that the you know, when you look at the amount of resources, the, the kinds of companies that are focused on making sure that they um, they lead and succeed in this marketplace, there are going to be innovations that tackle some of the things that we see as, as being kind of challenges, particularly you know, how uh, you know, do we have enough capacity in the last mile? You know, is the mobile network um, you know, fast enough? So we're, ex we're expecting there will be innovations that will surprise everybody. Um, so uh, uh, get ready for some surprises in terms of what, what, uh, what innovation is out there. Some of Actually, I have a question for for my fellow panelists because this is this is a I usually live in the in the weirdo artist world, um, and I very rarely have a chance to talk to the, the guys who are building the infrastructure that um, I and everybody else is relying on. So this is like this is really exciting for me. Um, the, you know, one of the things that that we're noticing in terms of making virtual reality content is that our needs, you know, HD video online is awesome. It looks great on your screen. It looks great everywhere. We, I mean, even you know, you can get down to 720p or, or 960 and still, you know, have a really great, um, really great quality. And and it's amazing, like the the way that those increments have happened. You know, 720 to 960 to HD. Those are those are very incremental. Um, changes. Now all of a sudden we're going from HD to 4K and then that's not even enough. We're going, I mean, we're finishing our content as 8K by 8K stereo lap longs over under. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, know. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Like, we're trying to serve up, you know, we're, when we're serving information to our headsets, if we're, if we're using MP4 codec, we're at 30, 30 megabits per second, which is like, you know, the, on the high side, you're talking usually 10 if you're dealing with regular videos. So all of a sudden, the needs for us have increased exponentially. And I think there's, there's a real opportunity here from the telecom side because brute force won't cut. You can, you know, up until now, it's been this brute force thing like, okay, well, more computing power, okay, well, more, you know, more more GPU power, well, we'll shift it over to the GPU, okay, um, you know, how we push it through the pipes, uh, bigger pipes, and I just don't know, I think that what's happening, at least what I'm seeing in VR, and, and this is, I mean, we're at 8K, that's not even big enough, like, we're talking about, like, oh, man, it's going to be so great when we get 25K stereo, and, like, whoa, like, okay, we can make that stuff, but, to play, you know, to play it, it, it becomes impossible to serve it. So I think that there's there's a conversation here around like, what's the next step? What what happens when we run up against the ceiling of brute force? And where do technologies like, you know, the distributed uh, distributed internet? Um, I don't know how many like IP, IPFS or you know these kinds of things. Like, when does that start coming into play? And how does that you know revolutionize kind of everything? I want, to, I want to hear hear what happens when brute force fails. Well, like, where we go? He's at the end of the spectrum. You ended up with like the PNP guys, the, the whole PNP forum that has been around, and I think it was Marty Lafferty runs that forum group. And it's it's almost uh, let's see if we can be illegal, but not quite illegal because we're moving around stuff that makes Jack empty. You know, consists of all the uh, old producers and ever. Have nightmares because you know you have digital rights management. You have uh, you know, people that need to have their their content secured. So that adds another challenge. But we just um, recently put together a bid for delivering content to the Middle East, and the Middle East is not the cheapest place to get a bandwidth in and out of. And uh, when we started the bid, there was 
one performance of the HBC Codex, and, uh, and uh, by the time, you know, three weeks later, they had come up with a new uh, HBC Codex that was reduced the bit rate required by 50%. And a bunch of that is the advancements of you know, chip technologies, uh, the, the, you know, everybody complains with their new iPhone that, oh, well, it doesn't have the latest chip, it should have the latest chip. And, then, and there's a validity to that. In order to, once we start getting apps to drive that, you have that situation. Um, so it'll, it'll be economics that will we'll end up driving it at the end of the day. But then, uh, you know, even the early adopters, you know, people were saying, oh, you know, the iPhone 7 is not going to be that much. But the advancement in technology is that much of an improvement that everybody, you know, but it hit records, you know, the iPhone 7 because the advancement in the technology. The, the bandwidth pipes, we're going to keep on, I think it's amazing the amount of bandwidth that uh, we keep on putting into the ground in 100Gs, we threw past 40G, like it didn't even exist. You know, we're sitting there with our new transatlantic high-speed, low-latency pipe going, okay, that next fiber pair, we're going to have to light it up with 400G waves. You know, that's the discussion point. There's no financial plan in, in that model right now, but everybody's going, we just, we shouldn't be wasting time with 100G. Um, you know, because you, you know, no sooner get it deployed and you have to put more energy. Well, that same scenario, uh, so you have both the bandwidth that you need to get in there, you got the marketplaces like Sweden that has, you can get fiber to every home, and so you have a 1G wave, and now people are talking about more than that into every home in countries like Sweden and South Korea, I believe, have that. Yeah, I'm sitting with 60 to 100 uh, make it to my home and go, oh, well, you know, because we have this and this and this and this, they don't have enough into that infrastructure. So the point of the end, uh, associate there from NTT, the point of the end last mile is really going to end up being the impediment. So the impediment that the, the, the Swedish people, we do a lot of work in Sweden, are sitting there going, well, that's all going to be Telia's whole model is it's all going to be taken over by the 5G infrastructure. Or, you know, going into into the home, so it's going to be a wireless delivery system. And um, you know, I, the infrastructure is, is is critical. The infrastructure is required, but I think at the end of the day, it's still going to be the devices being able to deal. I'm not going to be able to, no matter how much infrastructure I build, I'm not going to be able to deliver an AK signal unless I have the next evolution of the HPV signal. In place. It will not happen. And but there's, you know, if there's one person, there's a thousand people working on that next evolution. That's something. And I'll speak a little bit to your question on the compute storage side. What's the average server utilization running in a data center? 10, 15 percent. You know, that has highs and lows. And that's when I talk about application resiliency, the ability to move the workloads. There's a lot of untapped resources just laying around there, not being used. So that's one opportunity there. Rather than, like you said, brute forcing it, you got to look at what's there and be able to take the applications to a point where they can use those unused resources and move. You know, if it's not being used in the middle of the night, move the workload there and basically make better use of the actual compute and storage resources that exist today. Just off the top of my head, here, is there room somewhere when the internet became the end of 15 years ago? We had self development CDN. <coughs> Yeah. 
resistance to, uh, to, to having a level of prioritization. When you have an application with this, this hungry bandwidth, um, you're going to have to put something in place that, that, uh, that drives latency and sensitive traffic over, over non. So that, 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 uh, that will probably raise that issue uh, in, the, in the public forum. Um, the, uh, so I think I think that's you know, that's one area. Um, and, and, you know, your previous comment about the CDNs, you know, I think it's going to be another level of CDNs will be able to help with um, uh, you know with kind of last mile delivery by taking content you know, close to the end user. Um, so those are the problems. Can I just ask what are CDNs? Content delivery networks. So okay. they break things up into like web pages are, are composed of an HTML file and a lot of image files, yeah. some video. All those pieces would then be stored locally in data centers closer to the so you get user. When you ask for it, it tells you get from here much faster with much lower latency and then pieces rather than just one big, you know, 4K video file. Uh, so it's it's almost like a so it is sort of um, almost like a low level sort of distributed network of, of sort of mirroring. Yeah, it, it essentially allows people to place the pieces that they want to deliver closer to the people they're consuming, and we deliver it deliver it closer to the patients. So I think the difference with CDNs is it's really static content today, and that's what's going to change. So to answer your question, what what we're seeing our customers ask for again goes back to latency. They don't want to backhaul all this data you know, halfway across the country. So what we're being asked to do is put data centers in <coughs> locations like a power substation where I have fiber, they're available to me. Uh, not all substations are created equally. There are many substations that have never lost power in 60 some years. So if I can build a data room there and I don't need UPSs and generators, I can tie myself directly into the utility. That's an economical way of delivering those services in those local markets. Another example I would give is I've heard numbers that when you drive your electric car and you go and plug it in to fill it up, they download two gigs of data. Um, so there's an opportunity there. There's going to be a lot of power there. Or the bottom of cell towers. Think about the network is already going there. And more and more of the world is going wireless. Why not be able to put that compute storage and networking capability sitting right at the bottom of the cell towers? That's the Verizon Edge Cast model. <laughs> I say it's, it sounds easy to do, but it's yeah. actually a very challenging problem yeah. to figure wow. out. So, a um, couple of us in this room actually used to switch our TVs by actually walking up to it <laughs> and, and turning it. And the amazing thing that you have when this is a CDN deal. The amazing thing when you switch the channel, the other channel came right up. It didn't. There was no delay in latency. How many, you know? So when you choose your Directv, your Dish, or your Comcast, BIOS, or Time Warner, change the channel when you sit there and you wait for it to buffer and come in. Yeah, that's you know. So we've gone backwards. You know, we're it's it's so one of the um, technologies uh, that we're working with and uh, yeah, hope to be able to launch this year is a technology that times the internet and times the CDNs so that whether you're watching a VR version of an element or a uh, HD or an SD or a low res on your phone or a high res with the cameras, here everything is tied together. So you'll be able to watch the ISO on your phone of, um, uh, you know, I'm not a basketball fan, so <laughs> like say Kobe Bryant. <laughs> Who's doing the dunk, but at the same time, the cameras in the back end watching the overall goal feed, you'll be able to have them tied together. And have it. At the same time, you'll be able to have a VR version of that game. So somebody will be in the room watching the general TV, and you can be watching it in VR and you're in time. It's not like, you know, they're cheering and the game's over, and like 90 seconds later, you go, oh, what a play! <laughs> so it's the time. The whole internet together. That's a, that's a big development. Once again, you have to have the device that loads the app, whether it be a, you know an HTML plugin, uh, or whether it's a device. But all of those things, if you have that device in the end, now you have a reason to put five times as much bandwidth down that pipe.
to serve all the different types of people that are watching that different event. Uh, you know, whether and it, and it applies to not just sports is the most logical one uh, that uh, everybody applies that to, but but it's an annoyance uh, that we don't really know until it's gone away to be able to have to wait for that channel. You want to tune that channel and you're waiting for the thing to load in. It's really not fun. And this gives it sometimes your entire model. So you have, like, if you have a Comcast OTT model, would be everything is timed together. So when you buy Comcast OTT model, and I'm not saying they're doing that, I'm just giving an example. I don't have any idea what they're doing. Well, that's a competitive benefit for them. So they would then say, all the 500 streams that you receive on here will be timed. And so it would be nice, sync time here. You know, our VR channel will be timed. And one of the demands for that is you have certain CDNs that are, they don't, they've got to develop that. Whereas now, some of the CDNs are going to a full open stack structure. So that you can integrate in it, somebody else can come along and you don't have to, oh well, integrate into my system. No, it's it's an open stack structure, so I just layer it on top of my infrastructure. Uh, all goes down to software and the telecom people are supposed to say that. Time flies a bit, so let's open up the questions to the audience. Does anybody have a question? Shout it out for the small room. Uh, Ian mentioned peer to peer as a thing that changed around the audio world. Isn't that going to change VR? Can't we do peer to peer VR? Yeah, I, I think these guys have no more than I, but we've been looking into, I mean, we're, we're very excited about that. I think I think peer to peer as a, as a global idea for many industries. I think, um, you know, as, as our world gets more populated, as we um, Require more resources, and we require the movement of those resources. Finding solutions where our, you know, our sort of points of production and our points of consumption, uh, points of production and points of consumption are co-located. Um, uh, that's that's going to be, I mean, that's going to be a huge advantage because, you know, as these guys are saying, like you can only lay. Like you, you can lay bigger pipes, but you're just going to have to come back and lay bigger pipes again, and lay bigger pipes again, and lay bigger pipes again. It's, you never, I mean, I, I, you know, we're talking about 24K. I mean, that's just video. Like, I'm not even talking about the 3D textures that I want to get in there that I can't right now. Like, and, the, and the geo and, and all this stuff. And, and you know, and software will, it, it'll be in the middle at some point. But, but yeah, that, that peer to peer idea, I mean, that's exciting from, uh, from not only a, an information distribution standpoint, but also from an energy production and distribution standpoint, and, and transportation, you know, all these um, sort of getting away from the idea that you know that, uh, that that we have to sort of get everything brought to us, and and you know how can we more like be our own sort of data gardeners you know, in a way, you know, have. Have our, each, each have our own sort of data gardens that we're able to share with each other. I think, you know, the blockchain and what's happened with Bitcoin um, enables that now in a way that has, has never been possible before, you know, in terms of protecting, um, you know, ownership of IP and, and the economics of, of sharing information. So that, that's, that's my, my take on it. Is the infrastructure ready for peer to peer delivery? I don't know how you pay for all this sort of stuff on, on a linear, you send out from the central control point, uh, you know, the bit splicing and everything gives you an advertising model, this is good, you have the interactive, but, you know, there wasn't there recently a ruling that Pandora had to pay a very big penalty for, for a bunch of audio, and that the, for the first year, many years, that the audio rights payments uh, checks were going back up instead of going down the tank since the uh, you know, CDs have effectively been dismantled and it's a streaming world. And that was, I guess, uh, the model is that finally the economics caught up with technology. So you, you, you need to make sure that your economics keep in touch because people
the 90s where all of a sudden, okay, well, no, now I can bank with the internet. You mean I can, you know, use this thing for to, to complete high-level financial transactions and, and sort of complete the daily tasks of my, you know, of my life? Okay, great, yeah, sign me up. Um, when VR hits that level of utility, and I don't know when that's going to be. It could be next year. You know, it could be three months from now. It could be, you know, it could be five years. I think the thing that's going to take a while or it is for that sort of, is for people to get into the practice of it. So, you know, like with any new technology, it's, it, it's, it's here. We're not yet ready for it. We don't yet really know what to do with it. You know, we're sort of looking at this advanced, you know, it's like advanced alien thing going, oh, it's kind of, you know, what, what do I feel you know, sort of thing you know, like a rock um, thing in 2001 and, and and like I think when we finally crack it open we're going to see esports that you could never do in real life there's already one a uh, hundred foot robot golf you play as a hundred you play golf as a hundred foot robot in like crazy you know it's for PSVR and it's like so fun and stupid, but there's going to be like a real version of that. We're um, at our company. We have a mixed reality setup that lets you um, we can like roll into an event and let you see somebody responding to the virtual environment in real life. And like that, just as a piece of communication for the experience, you know, gets away from the, the funny internet videos of you know the, the woman on the roller coaster, but she's really in an armchair and everybody's laughing at her. Well, if you can see the roller coaster around her. Then you know you might you might have a different response, and if you can see people in VR competing against each other, well, that could be you know that could be really cool. And if they're doing something that like we can't even really imagine right now, like oh that person flew through space, you know, and spun the streamers into the most beautiful shape uh, in the least amount of time, like that could be a whole sport that we could never do right now, but we can do in VR and capture people's imagination, etc the same way that basketball does now. You know, anyway, I'm just saying these things are possible. It's, it's like a question of when, when and where are we going to need them, um, culturally. So, uh, yeah, so, so I, 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 yeah, so I, I think, you know, the, the other panelists have kind of alluded to this. You know, there's a timeline that we used to see, um, but the question is, you know, has innovation accelerated in general? You know, we, have we got a, a VC infrastructure and a, and a software development community globally that means that things are going to happen faster? I think the, the, the driver will be, you know, what's, what's the killer app? Right? I mean, um, AR and the VR were, were kind of niche ideas um, that a lot of companies were playing with. Uh, Pokemon now has kind of opened people's eyes to the potential. So although it may not be a killer app that everyone needs, everybody's going to be doing it every day, it's, it's been hype for how addictive it is for people's kids. You know, and how people can go on the train station platform playing the game and that kind of stuff. Um, but then, so you compare that to Google Glass, which on the face of it was a great idea, but it's what's happened to Google Glass, and it's kind of petered out. So, so you know, what's a killer app, and is that going to accelerate a traditional 10-year cycle? And then you got to look at, um, you know, why have other things been adopted quickly? You look at the cell phone, I mean, um, you know, I, I remember coming to the U.S. and being amazed at how many cell phones there were here. And, you know, in Hong Kong, I, I walked on the street and the guy collecting the trash was on the cell phone to, to his life. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and what's, you know, what's one of the things that, that, that's affected cell phone usage is there's a concurrent, you know, we've got seven hours of work, we've got seven hours of sleep. You got a little time left to do other stuff, um, and there's lots of other stuff to do in the day. Well, the cell phone you can do kind of concurrent. Like you can you can use your cell phone. Everybody's multitasking. They're checking checking text. You know your kids are checking text. You know, cell phone probably twice as often as you are. But, but we're all doing stuff while checking. You can only do one thing. You know maybe that's going to change. Augmented reality, well, you, you know, there's potential there. You can do other stuff. You can see the world and maybe do other stuff. So maybe augmented reality, when you look at what's going to get adopted and how quickly, maybe augmented reality, just because we've only got a few hours left in the day between looking at our phone and doing other stuff.
stuff, maybe that will get adopted a little more quickly. Um, and then, you know, is VR and AR going to be a, an entertainment, or is it really going to break in, you know, are we going to end up with some uh, industrial and, and uh, uh, enterprise type applications? So maybe, that, maybe the entertainment is going to get adopted way faster just because of the volume of developers working on this, you've got names like Google, Microsoft, you know, HTC, uh, you know, all, all coming out and working hard, Facebook, on, on how, to, how to make this kind of exciting and, uh, uh, and rapidly adopted, give them each an edge of, uh, of each other. So, uh, so maybe the entertainment side gets adopted quicker than the enterprise, and the enterprise takes 10 years to get along. So those are so look, I want to echo what he's saying about AR. I think that that's right on. I think that, um, and, and I think Snapchat's going to be a major, is going to almost dominate that space. The, the glasses that they just released, you know, they, they seem to be catching on. They're not suffering the, the Google Glass fate. And, and, and I also want to just point out this, this thing about Pokemon Go. Um, that game is actually based on a game called Ingress that came out that I've been playing for like years and love it. Level eight. If anybody wants to go attack the portal, that let me know. Um, uh, but it's and, and it, that game was as addictive to me as Pokemon Go was to you know all these all these youngsters getting into the AR games late. Um, and and the but what's interesting about Pokemon Go is that it didn't that kind of gaming didn't catch fire until it was associated with something that everybody already knew about. Right, until they cast a celebrity in this, in this Pokemon. And all of a sudden, everybody lost their minds. Where, whereas the same game, the exact same game mechanics, and I would argue even a little bit better game mechanics, were already present in this like capture the flag game. It just didn't have a celebrity attached to it. So I think that's like, you know, for, for sort, of, sort of knowing where the wind blows, like, like where, it's again, it's like that intersection between technology and culture. And, and where that happens, and I think like, that's why I think Snapchat's going to win the AR, the, the AR game, because they're already so in the culture, and, and they have the technology. I mean, it's just a, I'm really excited to see what happens with, with that company. Now we all have to go check out the Snapchat team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we are out of time.